Thank you again. Thank you again, praise team, for leading us in our worship and focusing on the Lord and uh, following God in our lives, every day of our life. Um, in your Bibles, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. Right after the Proverbs, we're going to take a quick tour through the book of Ecclesiastes to look at an outlook on life that, that comes from God and um, examine you know, just how we look at things um, in this world around us. Ecclesiastes, we're going to start in chapter 1 today. Uh, today I want to read verses 3 through 9 as we, as we begin. Ecclesiastes. Chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Starting in verse 3. What advantage does man have in all his work, which he does under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, and the earth remains forever. Also the sun rises and the sun sets, and hastening to its place it rises there again. Blowing toward the south, then turning toward the north, the wind continues swirling along, on, and, its, and on its circular course the wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. All things are wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Here today and gone tomorrow. Or if you have that perfect head, hair today, gone tomorrow. The rest of them just have to be covered up. Here today, gone tomorrow. That's my perspective on the um, book of Ecclesiastes. That's the perspective that we see as we, as we read through this very interesting book. Hopefully, as we, as we go through these next few weeks and, and look at these different chapters, we'll find uh, what God is saying to us in application of, again, this book. Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Are you happy about life? Is life fulfilling to you? Can't wait for a new day? Well, that'll all change when we go through Ecclesiastes. Now, I know that we have our good days and we have our bad days, but generally, how do you think about life? Is it fulfilling to you? Is it disappointing to you? Ecclesiastes begins with those famous words, the words of the preacher the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Now we assume that this is Solomon writing this, the son of David, the wealthy and wise king. Obviously, the, you can read different commentaries and different ideas and people come up with different thoughts of who they think, but it really looks a whole lot like Solomon um, in, the, in the way that he describes himself. But he has a perspective in this book that is very different than the perspective you read about in um, the book of Proverbs. And Solomon wrote most of the book of, uh, most of the Proverbs. When you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, you see a quest for the meaning and the purpose of life. What is the meaning of life? Is that a question that we even ask anymore? What's my purpose? Do I have a life's purpose? Do you ask yourself that question? Have you asked that question of yourself? Years ago, researchers at John Hopkins University surveyed nearly um, 8,000 college students at 48 universities and asked them what they considered very important to them. What were their goals of life? 75% said their first goal of life was finding a purpose and a meaning for life. So I think that, that desire is there, that to have that outlook on life, to come to, to grips with what is my outlook on life? What is my purpose in life? I, wanna, I want to look through Ecclesiastes because there's a trap that I believe that the church has fallen into. You see, we, we say we follow God, we've put our faith in God, we, you know, we come together and we worship God, but somehow that doesn't always translate to our daily life. Somehow all of a sudden we leave this place and we get involved when, in the things of everyday life. And, and all of a sudden we start living by the outlook of the world. 
We, we live by the philosophy of the world instead of the philosophy of God. All of a sudden, we search for the world's wisdom on things instead of searching for God's wisdom on things. And so we need to make sure that we translate our faith into our outlook of life, our philosophy of life, the way that we view life, so that will affect our decisions, our actions, the way we treat one another. All that will, I believe, change as we have this proper understanding of what life is all about. What I hope is that we will see is there's a futility in these worldly philosophies that are out there. There's, there's nothing eternal about that, and therefore, since we are eternal, we believe in heaven, and we plan on going to heaven, we need to begin now in our perspective of things to see it in, as, as we would see God's plan for our life. Now, this is important to make sure we understand. The perspective of the preacher in Ecclesiastes is that if you take God and you take heaven out of the equation, what does life offer? What does life expect from you? That's the perspective we get in Ecclesiastes. That you, you take God out of the equation, you take eternity out of the equation, just look at life, this life that we're in. What does this life expect from you? What is this life going to give you? And he says, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Now that word even is, is a hard word to translate. If you, Different Bibles have different words there. But the best that I guess they could come up with in translating into our language is that it means something about being temporary, a little bit of meaninglessness. Even with the idea of the vapor, your life is like a vapor that James talks about in the book of James. In other words, as we, write, as we hear from the preacher in Ecclesiastes, no person or pursuit in and of itself will bring lasting satisfaction. Everything's just temporary. Everything's just temporal. There's no ultimate profit in life. Now remember, that's a view of life that doesn't have God in the equation, doesn't have eternity in the equation as well. In fact, one of the phrases you will read over and over again in the book of Ecclesiastes is under the sun. And under the sun just means it's a description of this world without any spiritual influence at all. Just this world by itself, just this life that's around you and the people that are around you, what, you know, what is happening within this realm without God's involvement? What would it be like if God were not involved? I hope that helps us have an understanding as we look into, dive into um, the book of Ecclesiastes. The, this writing style is different than other writings in Scripture. But we, if we understand what's going on, then we'll be able to get the truth that's being brought to us and find the application in our lives. I've entitled this message, Life is Tiring, because when you have this perspective of life that I just described, and you'll see the futility of life with only this perspective, it'll wear you out. It'll just make life tiring. That's what we find in chapter 1. Let's take a look at what he says in chapter 1. We find that life is tiring because life is fleeting. It just, it's just temporary. It's just passing you by. It just continues to move on, and you're just a little speck in this big life, and, and nobody's going to pay attention to you. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. Now you think about it. You have your life. You're born into this world, and you start developing in this life, this life that you have. You're, you're involved in activities in your life. <coughs> Some things might, you know, just as a young person, you're involved in the activities of your family, and you're going to school, and you're, and you're going through life. And then you start growing up, and you start, um, you know, kind of deciding your, your path of life, where, where you're going to go with this life. <coughs> I keep getting the balloons I've already, that I haven't blown up, and these things are getting hard. <laughs> Life is tough. <laughs> It'll take your breath away. And um, so you, and you start, you start de kind of developing your own life. You're thinking, this is what I want to accomplish. You start setting your goals, the things you want to accomplish, the things that you want to possess um, in this life, your dreams of life, and you continue to grow. <laughs> you eat more tacos. And... Um, <laughs> Then life looks like this. 
And so you, you just get, you start going through life and, and life is going along and you're just developing this life and you're deciding what's important and, you've, and you have a family and, and you have your job and you have relatives and you have your friends and you have your activities and all these things that are going on in life. And then you come to retirement and you want life to be nice and easy, the golden years, right? <laughs> they call that the golden years. And, um, and I've talked to enough retired people, they say it's not very golden. And, um, and so you, you go through this life, and this life comes to an end, and that's it. You're gone, and you're forgotten. And life just continues to move along without you. That's hard for us on our flesh. But that's the perspective in the book of Ecclesiastes about the futility of life if this life is all there is to it. If there's no God involved, if there's no heaven involved, no eternity involved, all these things that you want to do and accomplish and you build up in your life, they're just going to be gone. In fact, he asks, he asks a question demanding a negative answer, basically, in verse 3. He says, what advantage does a man have in all his work which he does under the sun? The temporal advantage is, this, this life advantage of what he's talking about is, there is no advantage. There is no advantage to do all those things. If, when you look at it that way, work seems pointless, it quickly passes, and it just becomes monotonous. Think about your cycle of work. You know, if you just kind of take one perspective of it, you do about the same thing every day. And then you repeat it. And then you repeat it. And then you repeat it. And, you know, it reminded me of a time where a friend of mine and I, we were talking um, back in Oregon, and uh, he was talking about um, his wife was complaining one day. And she said she was a stay-at-home mom and you know, little kids, and, he, you know, he goes off to work every day. And, and one day she just, you know, is just kind of fed up with it. And she says, my life, I get up in the morning and I pick up toys and I put toys away and I sweep the floor and I mop the floor and I vacuum and I clean the kitchen and I straighten up and do the cooking and the cleaning and all this. And then the next day I get up and I put away the toys and I sweep the floor and I mop the floor and I vacuum and I clean the kitchen and I fix the meals and I take care of things. Get up the next day, I pick up the toys and I vacuum and I sweep and I dust. You know, same thing. She just kept saying, my life is just monotonous. It's the same thing day after day. And he says, well, I don't know why you're complaining. My life's the same way. He, he put in septic tanks and he says, I go to a field and I dig a hole and I put a septic tank in it and I dig some trenches and we put in the drain field and I hook up the pipes and I cover it all up with dirt and pat it down. Go the next day to another field and I dig a hole and I put a septic tank in and I drill and I dig the trenching and for the drain field and we hook up all the pipes and we cover it all up. She says, yeah, but it's different. He says, well, why is it different? She says, you get to dig a new hole every day. <laughs> she says... Think of this this way. You go to one field and you dig and you put in the septic tank. And then you go back there to the exact same place the next day and it's all gone. And you have to do it again. And you have to dig that hole. It'd be, you know, um, what was that movie? The um, Groundhog Day, right? And you have to, and you're just doing the same thing every day. She said. And so when you think about life that way, it just becomes monotonous. You plant some cotton, right? It grows up. Then you have to, have to harvest. Then what do you do? you got to plant it again. It just goes, I want you to feel bad if you're a farmer. And it just goes on and on and on. See, life is just this cycle, this repeating cycle, and it just wears you out when you think of it that way. And then Solomon, to answer that question, he gives, he gives four answers from nature around us in verses 4 through 7. First of all, in verse 4, he talks about the earth. He says, a generation goes and a generation comes and the earth remains forever. This earth, it's just spinning, right? Just spinning, 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 revolving, revolving, revolving. And a generation comes, think they're pretty hot. They've done a lot of things. And then all of a sudden that generation is gone. 
Earth is still spinning, still revolving. And then another generation comes up. They think they're even hotter than the last generation. They know more. And that, that Earth is just still spinning, still revolving. And another generation comes. It just keeps on repeating. If you start looking at it that way, just wears you out. The, where's, you know, it's, everything's just futile when you see it that way. He talks about the sun in verse 5. The sun rises, the sun sets, and hastens to its place so it can rise again. That poor sun, it comes up, goes down, comes up, goes down, comes up, goes down, comes up goes down and it just he keeps having to repeat the same thing over and over just wears you out thinking about it uh, he talks about the wind verse 6 blowing toward the south turning toward the north the wind continues swirling along on its circular courses the wind returns it can't stop and it just you know the wind blows it blows really hard you think it would run out of wind no there's more wind the next day it just keeps on blowing and you think that's that's it for the wind it's all blown out no it just keeps circling around and comes back and it's blowing again on us just this circle of the wind blowing the sun going up and down the earth spinning generations coming and going just wears you out thinking about it. He even talks about the water in verse 7. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea's not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. He's not talking about the water cycle and, and evaporation. He's not trying to describe all that. He's just saying, why doesn't the sea get full? Why doesn't it just start overflowing on everything? And all of a sudden, why do those rivers just keep flowing? I mean, the water flows. It should stop eventually, right? It just keeps flowing. But there's this cycle that just keeps on going, just keeps on going. There's no stopping it. That, that sea won't fill up. The rivers keep flowing, and it just keeps going and going and going. Just to give us this picture of life, it just, just continues this cycle, and you're just a speck in that cycle. Are you feeling bad yet? I mean, <laughs> you were feeling good when you came, but oh, preacher, that was a great sermon. Thank you very much. Life is fleeting. If we don't have a bigger picture of things, if everything under the sun is what life is all about to you, if the outlook of this world is what you've bought into, what this world tells you to get in your life, then life is fleeting. Like they say, you know, you see a hearse, there's never a U-Haul on the back of that hearse. You know, no trailers on the back. You're not taking it with you. You're just going to live your life. You're going to get your stuff, and then you're going to die, and it's going to get spread out to people, and that life will just keep right on going without you. Life is fleeting. If we have that small perspective of life, it'll wear you out. And also, with that perspective of life, then life is disappointing. It's disappointing as well. If we, just, if we buy into this idea of this, of this temporary life, of the, what the world offers us, and say, this is my life, even though we've put our faith in God, but we've kind of put that over here, if we buy into this is my life, then all of a sudden life will become disappointing because we're not easily satisfied. Verse, um, verse 8, all things are wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. You know, some, somehow our senses, all of a sudden, they get turned off to what was pleasant to them. Something that you see that is pleasant to you, or you hear, or you experience in life. And you, and you say, oh, that's just fantastic. And then you see it again, or hear it again, or experience it again, and say, you know, it's pretty good. And you see it again, and you hear it again, and you experience it again, and well, that's okay. And you see it again, and you hear it again, and you experience it again, and it's like, I'm getting tired of this. You know, we just, all of a sudden, we're just not satisfied in life. You know, we think, oh, if I can just have this, I can just do that, I can just accomplish this, and, and you think, that's what's going to make me feel satisfied in this world, and you get there. And you're not satisfied. That's what he tells us. In verse 9, he tells us that there's nothing new. And that's disappointing to us. That which, which, that which has been is that which will be. And that which has been done is that which will be done. So there's nothing new under the sun. And truly, there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah, technology has changed. We can experience some things that other people haven't been able to experience. We can talk about that. But think about Think about the world. Think about reactions. Think about situations and problems in this world. Has anything really changed? We have 
corrupt power in places. We have people killing people. We have people using their power to harm people. We have diseases. We have poverty. We have, you know, we have, we have people being taken advantage of and people taking advantage of people. Well, that's what the problems were before and before that. The problems haven't changed. Technology has. The way that we hurt people and do things and, and in life, that's all changed. But really, the way we respond, the way we, the, you know, the drive of, of, of people in life, that hasn't changed. There's nothing new under the sun. And then in verse 11, the preacher says that we have a problem with memory as well. And I wrote something down about that, but I forgot what I wrote. There's no remembrance of earlier things, and also of the later things which will occur, there will be for them no remembrance among those who will come still later. Think about the things in your life that you think, boy, this is important. I want to always remember this, right? Uh, you know, things that we've experienced in our life, you know, we think are important. But then just try to go back to the people that lived before you, the things that they thought were important or the experiences of their life or what we call history, which maybe they experienced, you know, that was very important to them, and we may not even know it happened. Or if we did know that it happened, we may have forgotten it. You know, you, something that you've experienced and you'd hope that uh, the next generation would at least know about it, and they don't. Again, whether they've heard about it or just have forgotten because it just doesn't mean much to them. I think that's why, I think that's why pictures and videos are so important for us. We want to capture that moment, and we want to be able to go back and look at that moment again and remember that time of our life and those events of our life. We don't want them to just fade away um, in our lives, but that's what this life does. That's what it offers. Those memories just fade away, um, and, and through that, if we don't have a different perspective, we will be greatly disappointed we want to have some significance. That's what our flesh wants. We want to have significance in this life. We want to know that when we're gone, somebody's going to remember. Somebody's going to re think, that person, look what they accomplished. Or we just want this world to just stop for a moment and recognize where we are and what we've done and, and, and give us that, you know, that reception of, of uh, an honor of, wow, look what you have done in your life. We're, what is it, the 15 minutes of fame? You know, we want that in our lives. That's what our flesh wants. You know, if you've, you know we may have gone beyond that, hopefully, in your, in your faith, that that's not the issue, but that's what our flesh wants. Our flesh wants us, the, wants this world to stop and notice us so that we are significant in this world. I think an illustration of that, I could be completely wrong, but I think an illustration of that is Brett Favre. Some of you know who Brett Favre is, football player, great quarterback for the Green Bay Packers, led the Packers to a Super Bowl. And then years later in his, in his football career, he decided he's ready to retire. And so Brett Favre retires. And Green Bay says, okay. And then, I don't know, but I imagine from what happened that all of a sudden, Brett Favre is not in the limelight. He's all of a sudden not leading a football team. He's not, he's not involved in all these things that, that gave him all this applause and all this um, uh, notice in his life. And I think that was too much for him. And so he unretired. And he called the New York Jets and said, can I play for you? And they said, sure, come play for us. And so he went and played a year with the New York Jets. Had a pretty good year, did all right. Um, but at the end of that year, not sure exactly what happened, but he decided, I'm going to go ahead and retire. And the Jets said, fine. And so he retired. And again, I don't know. I don't know what went on in his mind, but it sounds like from what happened is that all of a sudden, he got tired of not being in the limelight again, and not, he got tired of the, the loss of recognition and the, the excitement of being part of this game and all that stuff that happened, so he unretired again. This time, he called the Minnesota Vikings and says, can, can I come play with you? And they said, sure, come play with us. And so he started playing for the Minnesota Vikings. Had a good year, almost made it to the Super Bowl with the Minnesota Vikings, just came a little bit short. 
And then he finally retired again. And now I guess he's just doing Levi commercials and razors and stuff. So I think that's a picture of what our flesh struggles with. We want to have some significance. We want to be in kind of the middle of things. We want this world to slow down and take a look at me and see what I have done. That's, that's our struggle in this world. And if we think that we're going to get that from this world around us, we're in trouble because we're not. Because that's not what this world is going to offer under this sun. Now, we get a perspective of giving God the glory and doing, living a life for his honor. That's a whole different ballgame. We'll get to that in Ecclesiastes. But right now, Solomon is painting this picture of what life is like if you just want to live by the rules of this life and what this life offers. It's not going to be as exciting as you think it's going to be. It's not going to be as fulfilling as you think it's going to be. We need to see a bigger picture. Get some, we get some bits and pieces of that bigger picture throughout Ecclesiastes. I'd, I'd encourage you to read through the book of Ecclesiastes. We get the final big picture at the end of the book, which helps us bring it all together. But along the way, this outlook of life under the sun, without God involved, that's what the book of Ecclesiastes is showing us. And it shows us the futility and disappointment of that. Church, we are followers of God. That means that we should have godly outlooks of life. That means that we need to say, God, how, what perspective do you want me to have? And that's what, should, that's what should affect the decisions that I make and the actions that I take and the thoughts in my mind that perspective, that godly and eternal perspective, things that will truly last. I think that's why Paul writes, when he's talking to the Philippians, he's talking about his influence so that others would follow Christ. He says, you are my glory and crown when Christ returns. He says, it doesn't matter all the other stuff in life, but the significance of knowing that he brought somebody to Christ, and that's an eternal thing. He says, that's what I look forward to when, when Christ comes back. I look forward to seeing the eternal things that I was involved with. We can have that perspective of life, if we'll take it. But that's what God offers us. We find in Scripture, we find um, a description of human wisdom and godly wisdom. Folks, we fall in the trap of looking to the human wisdom and say, what is, what is human wisdom here? What, is, what should I do according to what this world teaches me? Instead of saying, what's God's perspective on this? What's godly wisdom? That's what I need to have. I think Ecclesiastes paints that picture so that we see what happens if we go down that path of only wanting human wisdom instead of going down the path of godly wisdom. So take this journey with me as we go through Ecclesiastes. Remember to follow the Lord every day, and that should change our outlook. That should change our perspective of life, that philosophy that we have of life. So it's much more than here today and gone tomorrow. Let's pray. Lord, again, I thank you for um, your word that you've given to us. And Father... The book of Ecclesiastes may be a book that we don't read very often, but I pray that as we go through this, that you would um, continue to teach us your ways, um, your path. And Father, that we would um, uh, live and walk on that path for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.